Okay, last time we left off. So this is still Chapter 8. This is the second lecture out of Chapter 8. Last we left off, according to my memory, we were on this slide, and we were going over the sets of things that you would have to disconnect if you were taking, a, taking an APU out of the aircraft. And we had already put on our separate list that uh, we would need to uh, disconnect the starter motor, disconnect the generator, and so here's a new one that we can add to our list is the control, the controls. So I'm going to go to this list right here that we were looking at. And in disconnecting the APU, I don't have any more room on this one after heat shielding. So I'm just going to add to that list. So after heat shielding comes... Uh, controls and I'm going to put there's two sets of controls there can be mechanical controls and there can also be electrical controls or electronic now although we've on this list called it uh, um, things to do when you're disconnecting an auxiliary power unit yesterday that we ought to make this list generic in that whenever we're taking a turbine engine out of an aircraft, what are those things we're going to have to pay attention to? Not just whether it's an APU or whether it's uh, the main power plant that propels the aircraft. So there, I'm going to, I mean, I know it's going to be tough, but we're going to cross this out and we're just going to write we're just going to write turbine engine fortunately you're taking notes in pencil so I'd like to write this as more generic because in reality this is a very generic engine is going to be a little bit different whether it's the PU or whether it's the main engine. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things on this list so far. The reason I got thinking of that because I was looking at this slide and I realized controls and APUs, auxiliary power units, there's no lever in the cockpit. There's no throttle lever. There's no knob or anything in the cockpit to operate. Has anybody in here ever operated an APU? No. It's ever operated an APU. APUs, huh? Yeah. When you operate an APU, generally speaking, the majority of the op APU is automatic. I've seen APUs so simple, literally, you turn on the electrical master for the aircraft, and you go to the control panel for the APU, and there's one switch, and it's got three positions, off, run, and all you do is lift the switch up to start, a little light comes on, and then you let go. And the APU up all, all by itself and goes to the RPM, and then it just because when you let go, and then when you want to turn it off, all you have to do is the switch, and it goes off. That's the most simple APU I've ever seen for operating from the cockpit is literally just making sure the aircraft power, electrical power is on because the starter motor on the APU needs to have some electrical power and one switch uh, you could have it the other way around and have two or three switches but pilots aren't that smart and so we're trying to prevent uh, bad things from happening. Also APUs you want them to be simple uh, so you don't, really don't even need a checklist to, to fire up the APU all right. So we're keep those and go back to the other one. So, okay, so the control in this case, whoops. What I've always seen, let me rephrase that, what I've never seen is the APU control going from the aircraft, the cockpit through the aircraft to the APU. I've never seen a mechanical lever. It's always been just electrical wiring.
And of course, these pictures. So what's probably the largest horsepower APU that, that's been installed in a jet aircraft? Okay, well, an Antonov is a very large cargo plane. They make the, let's see, is it the 124 is the big four engine job. And then they made one, is it the 225, the one they all hauled around the space shuttle on? I mean, the Soviet space shuttle that never went into space. They, I believe they made one of those. It has six in Okay, so that's, that's very large airplanes. How about the APU? Has anybody noticed that propeller job, that, that turbine out in the lab that's got a propeller on it? It's got that blue uh, place you can stand in there and fire it up and go woohoo inside, and nobody knows that you're saying woohoo. Okay, that's a Pratt Whitney PT6. The earlier versions of those engines probably put out between four and five hundred horsepower. The latest models that put out the greatest amount of horsepower are around fifteen hundred horsepower. They have APUs that are just Pratt Whitney PT6s that are that particular engine. And the output shaft is a gearbox to spin a big giant air compressor and to fifteen hundred horsepower to the output. How much power could you put into the pneumatic system, the bleed air system, and how much power could you put into the electrical system? Or someone might say, hey boat load. There's other kinds of loads that you can use, but I'm going to publish this on YouTube, so I'm trying not to say the S word. So you can have APUs that are huge, that are absolutely huge. Oh, great. That's a great point. Absolutely, yes. The question is, are there APUs on ships? And the answer is yes. The great thing, have you covered uh, jet engine fuel? In okay, what's the major component? In fact, the vast majority of out of kerosene and the biggest component, the mo the mo what's diesel fuel made out of? Kerosene. So yeah, you can run turbine engines that are designed for jet fuel on diesel fuel without any, any trouble at all. You can run 100 low lead in some turbine engines, but you got to look very carefully either at the pilot operating handbook or the maintenance manual and determine if yes, you can do it. And then generally speaking, if you can run 100 low lead in a turbine engine, there's usually a maximum amount of hours that you can do it between overhauls. Like I remember reading in a King Air a pilot operating handbook, it's got a Pratt Whitney PT-6. And it says between overhauls you can run 100 hours on 100 low lead. And you don't have to do anything different. Now. What's the downside? Does anybody know what the downside of running 100 octane av gaps in a turbine engine is? What? Lead deposits. And what's so bad about lead deposits? Don't we like lead? Isn't lead fun? Lead is heavy. And metal and metal. Lead is heavy. It's metal and can eat other metal. Inside of a turbine engine, the amount of lead that gets stuck to the inside of the engine is essentially insignificant. Um, Over time, it will corrosive. Corrosive. I mean, I'm correct. It causes a hot spot. So it's concentrated at that place. So that part. How about a mechanical engineer? How about a mechanical engineer? How about a materials engineer? Okay, sorry, you're all materials engineers because one of those top ten things you have to do or be or understand as an aircraft mechanic is what is going on with this with this material, whether it's fiberglass or carbon fiber or stainless steel or a nickel alloy or an aluminum alloy, what is happening to this piece of material while the aircraft is in operation or while it's sitting on the ground you know, in salt air in Hawaii. So in this case, you are a materials scientist or materials engineer because you hopefully understand that if you deposit even very thin layer of lead inside of a turbine, wherever that lead is sticking to the metal inside of the engine, 
that metal can't release its heat. And so that piece of metal is going to get hotter than it normally does. So here's a good question. What generally happens to metals if you heat them up more than they were designed for and you do this over and over and over again for long, long periods of time? You can do all kinds of bad things. It's more likely to crack. I think it's going to be more susceptible to fatigue. Is it going to stay the exact same molecular composition? Or might the molecules inside that piece of metal change? They, they might change. Or the crystalline structure of that metal. Let's, let's think about it for a second. You take a piece of iron and you get hotter and hotter and hotter. As it starts to get red hot, is it as hard as it used to be? No. Have you ever heard of the word annealing or heat treating? Yeah, okay. Engineers figure out how much to anneal it or heat treat it. We don't want to do anything different to it in the engine because there's lead stuck to it. Okay, I sort of got distracted there, but that was kind of fun. So now you all know if I say who in here is a materials engineer, remain seated, you know, nobody has to move. I do believe that's actually one of the top ten things you need to understand as an aircraft mechanic is what am I doing for this piece of aluminum? How is, how is the I found it in or what I'm going to do to it? How is it going to stay as long as it was yesterday for the next hundred hours or next ten years? So I don't recognize that APU, but it looks pretty big to me. All right. So you'll notice on this slide here, it says disconnect the exhaust gas temperature indicating system. Do we have on our list engine instruments of things to disconnect? Here we are, engine instrument lines and or cables. And when I say cables, I'm talking about electrical cables. So just to make sure that we get that fact. So we do have engine. So we don't have to write that down. And did we have on our list, here it says the bleed load. The bleed load control, wow, that sounds interesting. Can we control how much we're bleeding? Does anybody have a clue what that is besides me? I mean, I read That's right. Very good. So it's a, it's usually a small diameter, maybe only a quarter of an inch. It's really allowing pressure to go from the ducting of the airplane to whatever is on the APU. And if that ducting has too low of a pressure, it'll tell the APU, hey, there's not enough pneumatic air, there's not enough bleed air going into compressed air, going into the pneumatic system. So APU, go to a higher RPM. List, our separate list. Do we have bleed air? We have pneumatic ducting. Well, pneumatic is just a fancy word. I don't know if it's Latin or Greek for power due to air. So we have pneumatic. So have control lines, whether it's an electrical cable. So I don't think we need to specifically add this one. And then the next one is disconnect the fuel hose. Do we have fuel hoses on our list? Yeah, we do. Okay. But this brings up a good point right here. How many people have uh, uh, been smoking cigarettes and setting off fireworks while you're working on a fuel system on an aircraft? Not on an aircraft. But 4th of July in my driveway, give me some adult beverages and some and some fireworks, and I'm just jacking up cars and lighting bottle rockets underneath the fuel tank. Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't, you know, don't do that at home unless you have. 
Uh, and it, what that tells me is that if we're going to take uh, an engine, whether it's an APU or the main engine that propels the aircraft out of airframe, there might be some hazards that we have to pay attention to. So I'm... <laughs> This list is going to be, I don't know if we're going to call it hazards or hazard prevention. At the moment, we'll start with hazards. But be aware, we might start calling it hazard prevention. So, a hazard that just got brought up here is fuel spills. Actually, yeah, fuel spills is one. So what happens if you have a fuel spill? You can have a fire. And of course, the best way is to take a really nice dry broom and cause some static electricity by sweeping the fuel up on the ground. Right? I see a grin in the back. Is Brian? No? Fred, George, Mabel. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, your name is Brian? Okay, it's not Mabel or George. Okay, All right. well, I, that was one of the first names that came into my mind after Brian. So, Brian, what's the matter with uh, booming, sweeping uh, fuel off of the floor? If it produces static electricity, it could cause a spark. So, does anybody want to help out Brian and say, well, what's the best way if I've got you know, if I've got a quart of jet fuel on the ground and it's in a five-foot diameter puddle, do I just put a fan over it and put it towards the exit of the kitty litter? Kitty litter, yeah, yeah, it's kitty litter. Effectively, is you need something that soaks it up, and then you, what's that? Hot dogs. Oh, I see these absorbent rolls called hot dogs. Okay. They're literally, I believe, viewed that they were called hot dogs. So that brings up another point. Can anybody think of another hazard having to do with working? If you're going to take the engine off, are you not going to unscrew some fuel lines? So we're going to, so, well, in the, this moment we're talking about fuel lines. Are we going to unscrew some fuel lines? I know this is tough. Yes or no? Okay, all right. Everybody that thinks no is stand up. Okay, so too bad. No, not early today. You didn't stand up. Well, I, what you do and what you want is two separate things. I want to weigh 183 pounds. That doesn't mean I get to weigh 183 pounds. I got like seven more ounces to go, and then I'll weigh 183. So uh, you did say a good word there, Elizabeth. Pressure. So generally speaking, if, if do you, I've even seen this in automobile maintenance manuals, in particular the fuel lines going right up to the engine, is that thing has pressure in it. So when you unscrew it, psh, fuel squirts out. So we might not just be having fuel spilling on the ground. We could actually get fuel squirting on us, the maintenance technician. So what are some precautions that we could take? to prevent being, has anybody ever drank jet fuel? Anybody ever got it in your eye? Yeah, you have got it in your eye? That's pretty fun, I think, right? No, no, no. Did it did destroy your eye and then they had to amputate it? And yeah, that doesn't sound fun. You, you Both of your eyes look the same. Your eye transplant, that gave you the same color eye as the, uh, oh, you didn't get it in your eyes. Oh, okay, all right. So it's not just fuel spilling, it's uh, personal protection. Personal, what's that, PPE? Is that what Mr. Asman calls it? Proper personal, no, personal, yeah, PPE. So hazards is, so instead of saying fuel spills, or let me say, instead of PPE, what could we call that? I like this one.
If you'd rather write, you know, if you don't think you're a human, you can just say mechanic. That'll work. So there we go. So there's a couple of, what's that? Toxic fumes. Well, that falls under fuel damage. So I'm not going to go into the whole lots of things that you could do to make sure that you don't get hurt by fuel. Well-ventilated area, let off the pressure before you unscrew something, wear splat chemical goggles, maybe chemical gloves, put, you know, put a bucket underneath something. That's actually a great question. Generally speaking, the maintenance manager is going to say where to do it, but wherever you do it, you're going to need a bucket. So, so the, point, the point is, and that's a great question, the point is you need to decide where and when the fuel is going to squirt out. So you put on your splash goggles, you put on your gloves, you get out your bucket, and you do it wherever you're going to be able to control where that fuel squirts out instead of just jumping up there on the ladder going, to do to do to do I mean, not that saying to do to do to do is that bad, but if you're just saying to do to do to do and you're not thinking about what you're doing, then you won't have so much fun. So that's a great question. And the answer is it's going to vary by engine, but there's generally going to be one place where it's easy to hold up a bucket and unscrew something and have the fuel go where you want it instead of spray around all inside the engine compartment or on the floor or up your nose. Has anybody ever gotten kerosene up their nose? Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, yes? Oh, you're just grinding? Oh, okay. All right, so we're going to pay attention to fuel hazards for spills and fuel hazards against humans, in particular ourselves. All right, fire detecting equipment. Was that, is that on our list? That's not on our list. I don't know. I, I think Mr. Asman told me that you're getting some engine instruments in Mr. Ritchie's class. Have you had that stuff already? In lab. In lab. Okay. Have you noticed a difference between the wires that go to regular stuff versus the wires that go to temperature indicating things like uh, like thermocouples? What's the difference? Well, all the wires are insulated. It does look like the one EGTs or uh, thermocouples have big diameter insulation. Yeah, sometimes they're, they're specific colors. There's one thing I'm looking for in particular. Well, the wires get shielded. What's that? Size. Size, yeah, the size as in the length or the diameter. Yeah, and also, if you change the diameter of the wire, what happens to the electrical resistance? It changes. If the wire's a bigger diameter, it's easier for electricity to go through it. It gets less. And what if the wire's longer? Well, the insulation, as long as the insulation is working, it's not going to cause a problem. If you double the length of a wire, is it just as easy to push electrons through it? No. Is it harder or easier? It's harder. Okay. So if we change the size of the wire, or we change the length. Up in the wire. Okay, if the wire is twice as long, electricity get to the gauge? No. So thermocouple wiring, or for any wiring that's trying to measure temperature, it's usually very, very important that it's the exact gauge of wire, the exact diameter, and it's the exact length. And typically, for specialty wires, and you don't just 
roll of it in the shop and you measure the older one say okay it's 10 feet long here I'm going to get another piece and cut it 10 feet long usually that exhaust that EGT that exhaust gas temperature or whatever that thermocouple wiring is is usually very specific and you order it by part number and it's already made and you generally don't repair it and fire detection although fire detection electrical is probably not that critical I just had to say it Let's see, fire detector. I think we've already talked enough about, whoops, about electrical. But you know what? This is kind of important. Does anybody know what a bonding jumper is? It's the ground. So let's see, I think. They can be. So we've done fire detection. We're going to do uh, the, the, the ground, a.k.a. also known as bonding jumper. Let's see. Bleed air ducts. We already talked about bleed air ducts. That's on our list, yes? Can anybody confront one? Confirm? Push it out of the Three people say yes. Okay, so all we have to do is on there. straps, but it might just be a regular wire. Sorry, I'm still getting used to this gizmo, so my handwriting is not quite as good as it might be otherwise. I'll sell this to you for $300. I'll sell, the, I'll sell this tab, this uh, mouse tablet to you for $300. Cash. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you weren't, so you're not that not jealous enough to give me $300 for a $60 gizmo. All right. All right. So are you inferring that mine isn't quality? That's okay. All right. So if we look at the details here on this slide, rotate the compressor, point them downward, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So they're effectively saying you might have to wiggle things around. That's an aviation term. You might have to wiggle things around. So here I'm going to write it down. So during removal... Oops. So you're going to write this down. During removal, parts may need to be, and there's two G's in wiggled. Wiggled. Or adjusted, or, you know, the, the trick here, though, I guess, is don't bend things and break things. Has anybody ever removed and replaced an engine out of a car? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it, it, the, the downside of some, a lot of the engines we have here is they're already taken out of the airframe, and only a few things are hooked up. And you can get to the engine really, really easy. And to take the engine off of the stand and put the engine back on, it's reasonably easy because the rest of the aircraft isn't there. In real life, the rest of the aircraft is going to be there, so it's going to be noticeably more difficult than it is here in the shop. So let's see. Oh, man, I love those fish pole hoists. Here, I think I got another picture. There we go. Now, that, look, how big, look how big this is compared to that person. The, the reel here has a bigger diameter than the head of this person. It looks like it's about twice the diameter. So that means this reel here is 18 inches in diameter. Now that's what you call a fishing pole. I mean, you could get Jaws with this, right? Does anybody remember the movie Jaws? Yep. Seven, it, wasn't, it wasn't even scary. Well, when that movie came out, that was a scary movie. 
All right, so one of those things. Now, this isn't really on our list of things we have to disconnect. So, But I want to look on that list. And what did we call that list? We called it disconnecting. All right. So I don't think that we need to write down, oh, yeah, we better connect a hoist. Does anybody think that they're not that they're going to forget the fact that it's a 400-pound APU? Is anybody just going to stand underneath it and say, yeah, Mabel, let it go. I got it. I got it. I got it. It's going to land on my shoulder. I'm... Nobody thinks they're going to do that? Okay. I know we got a Fred. Well, actually, it's technically Frederick, right? But we don't have a Mabel. I need to come up with a name that nobody here is. Bob? Is there a Bob? Is there a Robert? So we could use Bob? All right, Bob and Mabel. That's going to be our, our AMP mechanics. All right, now what you're going to find with, I like these fishpole ones, but they're usually used for smaller things. Never know. Of course, you need one person operating each one. Here's the great thing about these fishpole uh, hoists is that you come up, let's see. I wish this picture was bigger. You, this is the top end of it. You hook the top end up into the aircraft, and that's where what holds all the weight. And then you hook this line actually comes down, and that connects to the side of your APU. And you can crank this lever up or down, and the APU goes up or down. In this case, whatever they're hoisting, it looks like they're using four of them. But it doesn't have to be an APU. Yes, you can get this up. Did not is on the aircraft. When I first saw this, I thought, well, you don't want to leave that in the aircraft. You'll have to carry around this 50-pound gizmo all the time. And they said, oh, well, look at this. And then they took it out. All right. So let's talk about uh, the hazards of lowering the engine. So in my example there earlier, it wouldn't just be a hazard to my back and throw my back out of place. It might squish me. Has anybody ever been squished by an aviation component? I was building this stand. I was welding up a stand for a jet engine at uh, in a pilot school, and uh, I had the engine installed on it. It was only like a, I don't know, a thousand pound engine, and the wheels on the stand were made out of steel, not rubber. And I was pulling it, and I, the thing was so heavy. Instead of just one wheel on each corner, I also put an extra set of wheels in the middle, so there were six wheels. And I forgot, and I was pulling it toward me, and I rolled it up on one of my toes. So it didn't hurt, and I rolled it off, and I went, wow, it didn't hurt. That's great. Yay. And then, and then uh, about a week or two later, I started noticing my toenail turning black and blue and purple, and about two months later, the toenail fell off. And then it grew back. It, it grew back into the shape of uh, Ganesha, the, the Hindu god. It's, if, if you're familiar with Hindu gods, Ganesha is the one that has the head of an elephant. I'm not, some, some Ganeshas only have two arms. There's some Ganeshas that are drawn with four. But the big deal, Ganesha is the head of an elephant. It's the patron god of students, if you're of the Hindu faith. He's the destroyer of obstacles. So people, so there are some people that are familiar with, sometimes it's pronounced G Ganesh instead of Ganesha. How many people, this is the first time you've ever heard of the Hindu god Ganesha? Okay, remain seated. Okay, so none of you have ever heard of it. Okay. I know, I'm just kidding. All right, so I want to talk about the hazards of dropping things on you. So I think this ought to go on our list. Hazards. Stop that, whatever that thing is. I wish it would stop. So hazards of turbine engine removal and replacement. Let's see. Let's see. Improper connection to the hoist. You think you got the crane hooked up correctly? 
but when you put weight on it, the bolt falls out, and it falls down and hits Bob in the head, squishes Mabel's foot, and then her toenail grows. She's probably going to get Vishnu on her toenail. But Vishnu is another. In- okay, never mind. Huh? Oh, yeah, that would be a great one. You know, I could take a Dremel to my toenail and, and carve it up to look whatever like I want. But now that's getting kind of gross, so we're not going to talk about my toenails anymore. Can anybody think of another hazard when you do with the, with the uh, engine in addition to you didn't? Ah, that's a pretty good one. Um, trying to think. Let's see. Uh, here, damage aircraft. during removal because you didn't take everything off that you were supposed to or you're banging around or uh... well was that does that fall under improper connection to the hoist okay so what's the difference between the stand and the hoist Well, you're talking about after you've gotten it down out of the aircraft and you're setting it down onto the stand. Okay. Uh, so that's a good point. After you got to get it, you got to get it onto the hoist correctly, and now you got to get it from the hoist onto the engine stand. Generally speaking, you're going to generally put the stand that the engine's going to go on right underneath the engine. So you just are setting it straight down, you line it up, but now yes, you still got to put bolts or some type of a connection so the engine sits on the stand. So yes, one could do that incorrectly. Bob or Mabel might fail. Buster, oh, from MythBusters. Except Buster is not very proactive. He doesn't actually do anything bad. Bad things just happen to him. If you're not familiar with Buster, he's just a crash dummy. All right, so we got it. we've got it. Uh, we cleared everything. Whoops. We didn't hit the aircraft structure, and it's on the stand. Okay, great. I'm happy that we covered on there what we needed. All right. So technically, the first part of this uh, PowerPoint here was talking about auxiliary power units, APU, but I sort of turned it into generic for any kind of an engine. But there are some points that are going to be in these next few slides. These slides are specifically talking about taking out the main engine, the one that propels the aircraft. Um, So there is some vocabulary that it would be good for you to know. And that's QECA is Quick Engine Change Assembly. It might also just be abbreviated QEC. for quick engine change. You need to understand, has anybody in here worked for an airline? I'm sorry, I don't know your name, sir. Dominic. Dominic, what airline did you work for? American Airlines. What did you do for American? Airline captain and you decided to change careers? You're an airline captain and you lost your medical. Okay, so you have some idea as a, as a former airline that the, for an airline, a major airline, they kind of want the aircraft to come in, up all the people, drain the, the water, the sewer, and the trash, and put everything back in, and put the people, maybe some new flight crew, and then push it out and, and be on time. So that's what. Okay, all right. So that's what they want for operation. Move it, and why do they want to do that? Because time is money. Let's say that airplane five times in a day, $100,000 per suite. Okay. 
only flies four times a day, they can only make four. And they got to pay for the gate at the airport. And they got plane payments. Anybody have a car payment? Anybody ever used to have a car payment? Got a car payment? Is there anybody in here that's never heard of the phrase car payment? All right. Well, there's such a thing as airplane payments. All right. Well, let's take it. Let's put it in the hangar. If we have this airplane in the hangar, well, let's, if we have this airplane in the hangar and it takes one day to fix it or it takes a half a day to fix it, which is the airline going to prefer, Dominic? It's going to prefer whichever is the shortest amount of time because that extra half a day, we could have put the airplane back out on the line flying and making money. So a long time ago, we're talking decades ago, somebody figured out, hey, let's don't just take the engine out slowly and have all these parts here and there. Let's take the whole thing out as, a, as one assembly. All we have to do is disconnect a bunch of stuff and then shove a whole engine with everything on it, all the... the the instrument senders and the starter motor and the generator and the oil tank and all that stuff is all bolted. You know, maybe even the cowling of the engine. So all you have to do is take this, open up a couple of panels, connect a bunch of stuff, bring in a new one, and now you can take one engine off and put another engine back on in half as much time, maybe a fourth. There is a downside of that because now you got to have this whole engine sitting there in the corner of the hangar, and you had to buy that engine, and you had to buy all the components that went on it, like the starter motor and the generator and stuff like that. But somebody, a bean counter, which is another word for an accountant, figured out that it's better to have one of these spaced around the country in our big airports because it'll cost us less money to make the payments on that $3 million engine than to lose half a day here and a half a day here and a half a day here and a half a day. So after a while, somebody figured out, yeah, this has, allows us for the airplane to be up or not down. Or we can improve dispatch reliability rates. So I want to purpose of a QECA is less time whoops, aircraft is out of service so this phrase I want to talk about this phrase out of service out of service means we're not getting to fly it we're not getting to use it if you're an air with it. I'm not trying to knock the capitalist and economic system. See me after class. We'll have an interesting discussion about economic systems in the United States and other countries. But in the system we have in the United States with airlines, airlines are there to do one thing, and that's to trade flying services to the public for money. And what the airlines are trying to do is charge more money than they spend. Anybody? That's what corporations tend to do. They try to bring in more money than they spend. So one way to bring in more money is to not have to cancel flights, or if you do, cancel less. Up. So if that, if that airplane comes in and, and the engine is busted, and that engine can get swapped out over the night shift, the plane lands at 10, flight takes off at 6 a.m. That's eight hours. And, and installed and rigged, tested it out on the ramp and run it up and say, yeah, so all the maintenance logbook did it all correctly, then flying. And I know it's complicated and I don't want to get into too much, but if that airplane doesn't take off that next morning or at 6 in the morning, it's not that flight at 6. It's not where it's supposed to be at 10 or at 2 or at 2 or at 4 or at 6 or at 8. And maybe it doesn't even end up, maybe it's even supposed to be at another airport at 10 o'clock that night. Maybe it started in Fresno, but it ends up in New Orleans four flights later. Well, if that airplane is still stuck in Fresno because you didn't get the engine switched, now tomorrow in New Orleans a whole other day's worth of flights don't, don't happen. 
So we're not talking about just missing one flight. We're talking about missing a whole day of flying, or maybe two or three. If that airplane's still stuck there in Fresno, when is that airplane scheduled to be back in Fresno? If it's not scheduled to be back in Fresno for three days, you may have just lost three days of flying revenue. So you can see why the airlines could say, yeah, I want a $3 million engine sitting over there in a the corner, because if I use it once every six months, it'll be cheaper than if I have to cancel three days of flying. And that one engine, it's good for every airplane that comes in, not just this one that was going to leave today. But if it fits 25 of the airplanes, then I might, I might have to use it on it against 25 different airplanes. So being in service is very important. And this is not just for the airlines. Let's talk about corporate jets. Let's talk about corporations that have flying machines. Now, their need for the is not to make money directly by selling it to customers, but if the chief executive officer of that company is so good that they can fly somewhere and time ends up being worth $10,000 an hour, then it's worth it to have a jet that costs $5,000 an hour to operate it. Well, what if the jet can't fly today and that the bar to and make its new deal how the company loses out $10 million profit? So it's not just airlines that want to have their aircraft in service. It's lots of people that own aircraft that want to have their aircraft in service. So let's see if we can define what is a QEC. I'm just running. You know what? I'll just leave it on that same slide. Why not? Let's see if I can find... Well, what's included in a quick engine change assembly? The whole shebang. Everything that's bolted to that engine is there. About the only thing that might not be there, you know what? The whole point is to have as much on there as possible. So that all you have to do is literally disconnect everything, let it off of the aircraft, hook up another engine, and you don't have to take anything off of one engine and install on the other one. Not the intake, not the exhaust, not a starter motor, not anything. That way the aircraft can get back in service. So if somebody said, so hey, we got a QECA over there, but it's missing a starter motor, it's not as useful as it would be. So somebody might say, yeah, we took that starter over because we needed it. A new starter came in, go put it on that QECA over there. And that QECA, that engine installation, it might have its own set of maintenance records. It would actually be signing off that you put a starter motor onto an engine instead of signing off that you put a starter motor onto an airframe. Have I lost anybody about QECs? Has anybody ever been in the U.S. military? A couple, one, well, only one person? Okay, that's all right. All right. Um, what did you, what did you, uh, you, you put, you, had, you got damaged by jet fuel once. Using what kind of trucks? Diesel truck. Oh, so it was diesel? Yeah. Oh, okay. So did, oh, it was JP-8. Okay, so JP-8 and diesel are technically different, even though they're mostly the same thing. All right, all right. Did you do any aircraft maintenance? Did you see any aircraft maintenance get done? All right. Does, does U.S. military, do they have quick engine change assemblies? Yeah, yeah, not just for aircraft, huh? Not just for aircraft. What, take the engine out? Oh, sweet. Did you get did you get to do that? What's that? Tons of, times. Tons of times. More than you wished that you had. All right. Okay. So if you're going to change an engine out, wow, here's a really good point. And again, just like before, we talked about if you're opening up the doors to the APU, you don't want the uh, wind flapping the doors around. 
if you're going to take an engine, let's just for fun, it's a, a 1,000 pound engine, if you're going to take it off of the airplane and put another one onto the airplane, do you really want the airplane moving? Probably not. Probably not. So you either need to chalk it down or tie it down. And guess what? A ground wire ground the aircraft. Has anybody had ground handling yet? I know somebody in here because there was a couple of people that this is their last semester. Oh, it's last semester? Okay, so semester one people don't have any idea what, what the word ground handling is anyway. It's the static, what, what I'm talking about is grounding the aircraft, literally connecting a piece of metal wire from the aircraft literally to the ground. And they put pieces of metal stuck in the asphalt or stuck in the cement, and there's clamps, and you put one on the ground on that piece of metal, and you put one on the airplane. Some airplanes actually have specific places where you can put the clamp on so it doesn't damage the aircraft. And that way, if a static electrical charge builds up on the airplane, or airplane It'll go through that wire into the ground, and you won't have any trouble. But let's say you didn't do it. Think about the rubber tires. Rubber is a pretty good insulator of electricity. So you could actually have blowing dust blowing across the airframe and cause static charge building up on the airplane. You could actually walk up to the airplane, and just as you go to touch it, that static electricity trying to get to the ground could go through that last inch of air, and it would hurt. More importantly, if there was some jet fuel that had just evaporated right there, it might catch the jet fuel on fire, which is one reason why you generally ground an aircraft while you're refueling it. So that's the second one. I think we're going to take these to our list. Tying down and to our list of hazards. Secure aircraft from moving. If it's inside of a hangar and the doors are shut, it's not so big of a deal. But what if somebody opens the door? Outside, it's definitely a bigger deal. And then electrically ground. ground. That's not just important outside, sometimes it's important inside. Is anybody getting excited about swapping out jet engines? Okay, I think swapping out jet engines is pretty fun. Let's see, I'm going to keep that and just for fun. Oh, it's six till. Um, I'll see you in lab at 30 after. Class is dismissed. <laughs>